I'm Sarah Gardner. It's all about cotton in this edition of America's Heartland. Cotton is very important to American agriculture. It's grown along the southern tier of the U.S. in more than a dozen states. Now, when you think about cotton, you may think it's just for jeans or t-shirts, but it's actually much more than that. I'm Jason Schultz. Coming up, I'll take you cross country to see how important cotton is in our everyday lives. Not only in the clothes that you wear, but how about in the milk that you drink? I'm Rob Stewart, and what's the connection between cotton, catfish, and chicken? We'll take you to Texas, where one chef says, without cotton, dinner at his restaurant just wouldn't be the same. It's all coming up next, right here on America's Heartland. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man in America's heartland, living close to the land. There's a love for the country and a pride in the brand in America's heartland, living close, close to the land. There's no denying that cotton is important in all of our lives. Just look in your closet. It's one of the most versatile fabrics in the world. Cotton processing, production, and sales generate more than $100 billion to the U.S. economy each year. And it all begins with a crop in the field. Come late summer across much of the Southeast, you'll find cotton farmers taking to the fields to bring in their crops of fluffy white cotton. And here on Jay Hardwick's farm near Newellton, Louisiana, cotton production is all about growing more while using less. We've made tremendous progress over the years in terms of harvesting efficiencies and our approach to it. Jay will rotate multiple crops on more than 7,000 acres. That crop rotation is important in marshalling equipment and human resources, utilizing science and technology to maximize efficiency the technology that's going into crops to make them insect resistant. This is a huge opportunity for agriculture because up to this point we've had to use a tremendous amount of pesticides to grow these crops. Well now cotton is being grown with far less pesticides uh, which would be comforting to many many people. In the 1920s and 30s boll weevils exacted a heavy toll on America's cotton crops. These days New pesticides and other eradication programs have gone a long way in controlling that insect population. The cotton planting to harvest cycle here on the Hardwick farm takes about 150 days. As part of the process, Jay decides when to spray his plants with defoliant, forcing the leaves to drop and making his cotton easier to harvest. What we're trying to do is allow the cotton to open to where it's 60% of the bowls, and this is the fruit of the, of the cotton plant, when that bowl opens up and is a co cotton like this, mm -hmm. that's ready to be picked. We try to create a harvest efficiency by opening up all the bowls so we can pick at one time. Okay, and, and how do you go about applying the chemical to the field? We use a, what are called a ground rig. It's a tractor with a spray boom on it, and it's a self-contained cab. Uh, the operator is in a closed environment, so he doesn't come in contact with any of the materials that we spray on the farm, so it's a very clean operation. Jay, his family and crew utilize technology in bringing in their harvest. Coordinating information from that variety of sources means a more efficient use of machinery and field time. Well, the adoption of new technology like uh, GPS equipment, satellite systems, uh, computer-based technology and software, you know, the lure of it is just so impressive. It's, it's almost as if you adopt this, you will have increased opportunities. Even with technology, a cotton harvest means long hours in the fields using specialized equipment to handle the picking and transport. The front of the picker are, are spindles and they're pointed, kind of like my fingers, and they have little notches on them. And those notches are rotating. And as they're rotating around in a drum, you are feeding the cotton through that drum. And then we have a tractor that's tied to what we call a bull buggy, a big basket on wheels. That uh, comes through the field, comes up alongside that cotton picker, and then he waits and they mechanically operate that and dump it into that big basket. A hydraulic cylinder compresses the cotton until it's tight enough to hold its shape. 
From the field, cotton will be processed at a cotton gin. The large modules will be fed into machines that clean and separate the plant material. Combing devices pull the fluffy white fibers from the plant, and the seeds are collected for later use in other products. Most of Jay's crop residue remains on the land. That no-till approach provides organic matter that reduces erosion and improves water retention. I think they say it takes 100 years to make one inch of topsoil, so you have to be a good steward to the land to, unless you don't plan on farming here for very long. And Jay is quick to point out that improvements in plant varieties as well as new techniques for fertilization and pest management have given farmers a chance to produce more while leaving a smaller footprint on their land. There's not a whole lot of land left, so we've got to do a much better job with the land that's available. It's our responsibility to preserve it, uh, protect it, but also make it as efficient as possible, knowing that the next generation, we want to turn it over to them so that they have the opportunity not only to provide uh, food and fiber for their time, but also to pass it on to their children. Cotton production in the United States began with the colonists in Virginia. It then spread south and west to Texas. When farmers began irrigating crops, cotton production expanded to Arizona and California. Most of us never get to see cotton in its natural state. The closest we'll ever get are these cotton balls you find in your medicine cabinet. More on these in a minute. But what happens with those large bales after they come in from the field? Well, before you make clothes, you've got to make yarn. Think about it. T-shirts, towels, all those white socks you own, your favorite pair of jeans, Right now, you're probably wearing something made from cotton. Well, this company was started in 1916, and uh, it started up as a thread company. And then in World War II, it converted to yarn to make gabardine pants for the military. Anderson Warlick is the president and CEO of North Carolina's Parkdale Mills. He's seen his company grow from one plant in 1961 to 34 plants today. Our company today is going to produce anywhere from 900 million to a billion pounds of uh, yarn per year. This plant in Mineral Springs spins customized yarn for printable t-shirts. All of the cotton that comes through these doors is selected for specific characteristics like strength, uniformity, and color. These bales are 500 pounds per bale. And what we do is we take this bale and we take the cover off and we take the straps off. The bales are lined up under an automated feeder that skims the tops, removing small tufts of cotton as it goes. What we're doing is we're taking off of 80 to 100 different bales. So we're, we're trying to blend out the variability that is inherent in any bale of cotton. So by taking it off 80 to 100 that we know the characteristics of, we get a more uh, consistent blend. The tufts are delivered to a machine that cleans and blends the cotton into a homogeneous mixture. From there, the rotating cylinder will comb or card the tufts into individual fibers. What we're delivering out the front are individual fibers that are rope in a rope-like structure that we call sliver. Next, six strands are combined into one in the drawing machine. And what a drawing process is intended to do is parallel the fibers get them from being individual fibers to aligning them side by side. There's one last step before individual cotton strands become yarn. They will be twisted together for strength and stability. Once we get them parallel together, that machine uses a rotor to spin the yarn. And what we do is we put those individual fibers in that rotor and add twists and we can make a yarn. This machine then spins and winds the yarn onto cones, wrapping it at more than 120 revolutions a minute. It is forming a yarn, and the easiest way for me to describe this to you, if you're not familiar with a machine like this, it's like throwing something onto the end of a tornado. And what we're throwing onto the end of a tornado is not a trailer or buses or things, but it's individual fiber. Cotton yarn, which will then be packed, wrapped, and shipped to a company that uses the material to knit or weave into t-shirts. But cotton goes into much more than just clothes. In 2007, the company acquired a firm making cotton-based consumer products. Other uses in our company would be cotton balls. Uh, we take the byproduct waste 
that we take out of the yarn and we bleach it and we make a cotton ball, a cotton swab, or a makeup pad. The U.S. cotton plant in Charlotte, North Carolina recycles and reuses cotton that didn't make it into yarn. The production techniques release cotton's natural softness in items most of us find in our bathroom or medicine chest. We are the largest user in this country of, of cotton, so it's very, very important that, that farmers are, are growing plenty of it so that we have a lot to choose from. But it's also important that we work together, uh, work together to improve production practices, work together to improve quality, look at different varieties of cotton. The mills here use a significant portion of all the cotton grown in the United States, and their additional production facilities in Latin America add to the supply of products sold at home and abroad. I think cotton is a very important product for the world. Uh, cotton employs a lot of folks, gives a lot of people great opportunities, and it's a, it's a wonderful product uh, for the consumer. We think about blue jeans as a totally American invention, but the cotton material they're made from, denim, was first created in France. Brought to this country, it was made into work pants by Levi Strauss. So you brought in your cotton crop, combed out the fibers, and you're left with lots and lots of cotton seeds. And while cotton is important for the fabrics used to make the clothes that we wear, those cotton seeds are taking off in a very different direction. Welcome to the Lone Star State, where cotton is king. Texas produces more cotton than any other state in the nation. And here at Pico Industries in Lubbock, cotton seed is the primary focus of their business. For years they had cotton seed as a waste product. There was a time when, when it was given away and people, people didn't need it for anything until they figured out that it had the oil in it. It can easily be said that Pico is squeezing out a profit from cotton seed. This Texas firm is owned by 60 cotton gin cooperatives and specializes in a range of seed offerings made from that one-time waste product. Right now, our oil on, on the crush products uh, carries about 53% of our sales dollars. Out of a ton of cotton seed, you make about 320 pounds of oil. And so uh, we will crank out uh, uh, we make about 720,000 pounds a day. Almost around the clock, dozens of big rigs deliver loads of cotton seed from the gins. First stop, machines that clean debris from the seed. When we clean it, we remove basically everything, all the foreign matter with the exception of the seed. Sticks, rocks, metal, burrs, anything that's come into the plant that's uh, not the seed. The seed then heads to stripping machines called delinters. They remove the tiny fibers of leftover lint found on the seed. That collected lint ends up being used in everything from mattress stuffing to food products. And they're used in differing di industries from, from papers to currency uh, and also made into cellulose which is used in plastics and uh, TV screens, different things like that. By now, the seeds look like just what they are, black hole cotton seeds. So next step, these machines crack open and separate the hull from the meat of the seed. Hulls are used in cattle feeding business. It's, uh, it's a roughage, they use that in the feed yard. The remaining part of the seed is smashed into flakes, heated and pressure treated into oily pellets called cowlets. Those pellets pass through a machine which finally separates the oil from the meal. We'll make about uh, 900 pounds of cottonseed meal out of a ton of seed and that's for cattle feed. Uh, it's, a, it's a great protein, 41% protein. As for the oil, Shipped by rail, it goes through one more process before being sold for consumer use in everything from salad oil to frying fats. We have a, a marketplace that goes pretty much east coast to west coast. Uh, we have some potato chippers that are on the east coast that uh, use like, quite a bit of oil in making potato chips. And the, uh, in the Bay Area likes it for the wok frying and, and so forth because of the attributes that our oil has. Cotton seed is uh, your daily life, and that's kind of what we look at. It's, it's in everything that we do. 
An average cotton fiber is slightly more than one inch long. That fiber is a single cell, one of the largest cells found in the plant kingdom. Oh, one other fact, cotton can absorb more than 20 times its weight in water. Cotton is grown from Alabama to California. Cotton farmers will harvest some 18 million bales on more than 10 million acres, and it has a long growing season. Farmers in Texas may plant the crop in early spring. In other parts of the country, it may not go in until June. But cotton farmers aside, there are a lot of other folks who stay busy with the crop year round. Cotton and cows seem an unlikely pairing when it comes to agriculture, but here on the Klein Peter Dairy Farm in South Central Louisiana, cotton has become an essential ingredient in the production of the farm's milk and other products. A century back, Jeff Klein Peter's ancestors raised cotton on this very land, pulling the fibers from the plant in their very own cotton gin, and then looking for a way to use the leftover seeds in hulls. Jeff, that was your great grandfather who started feeding cattle cotton seed, isn't that right? That's correct. He um, hated to waste anything, and we had a steam powered cotton gin in Louisiana, and the waste product was the cotton seed, and he was told by an LSU professor that if we fed that to cows, we'd have the best milk in the world. That was in 1910. Today, a large portion of all the cotton seed produced in the U.S. is added to the feed mix of cattle and dairy cows. The makeup of the meal, seeds, and hulls adds digestible protein and fiber to their diets. When I look at the feed down here on the ground, I can't see cotton seed, but it's in there. It's, it's, it's a mix, right? It's in there. It's mixed up with the, with the feed itself. Right That's here. the actual cotton seed, just like the end of a Q-tip. And we fix it, put that in there, and mix it in there, and fix it up for these girls. And the higher protein diet we put them on, the higher the fat content in the milk and the better the quality of the milk will be, the taste and texture. So we've been feeding it to our cows ever since 1910. While the Klein Peters get their cotton seed from outside sources, they grow other ingredients like rye grass right on the property. We're missing seven different ingredients for these cows. So we really have to give them a balanced diet, not only to get great milk production, but we need to take care of this animal as well and keep her healthy for as long as we can keep her, because she's an asset to our family business. There is another approach to dairy production here that most of us never think about. The farm's 700 cows get milked in a parlor where quiet is essential. Quiet in the milking parlor means a cow is going to be relaxed. She's going to let down more milk. She's going to milk out better. She's going to give better quality milk for us. And we believe that's the right thing to do, not only for the cow, but for our customers as well. In addition to the milk, cream, and other fluid dairy products, the Klein Peters have added ice cream to their production line in a bid to expand their operation outside the immediate area. Well, we ship our milk and dairy products and ice cream to all of Louisiana and part of the Gulf Coast of Mississippi. And we're looking into Texas at this point in time. So during a recession for our company to be growing, to me, is a special thing. And while the future is on the family's radar screen, Jeff admits that the efforts of those in the past really set the tone in creating a farming operation that's sustainable today and tomorrow. Sustainability is very important in our industry. That's how we feed cottonseed today. It was a sustainable practice back in 1910 to feed something to animals that would otherwise go to waste. And that's how we're still moving today, moving forward not only in the dairy farm industry, but in our process and packaging as well. We call U.S. currency paper money, but the bills are actually a blend of 75% cotton and 25% linen. Thousands of $100 bills can be made from one bale of cotton. You may not associate cotton with cooking, but the cottonseed oil that we mentioned earlier has long been a staple in kitchens across the U.S. and around the world. And if you stop by one restaurant in Texas, you'll find that cottonseed oil is essential to their focus on food. Okay, Frank, today we've got um, 150 people. Uh, we're gonna do catfish and fried chicken. The day starts early at River Smith's restaurant in Lubbock, Texas, where they're not only known for their fried chicken and catfish, but also for their particular method of cooking. We 
cook it in the cottonseed oil at about 350 degrees for about five minutes and it comes out a golden brown and the flavor is just unbelievable. Cottonseed oil has been used for cooking since the 1880s and was a key ingredient in some of the first shortening products sold worldwide. Today the oil is used in salad oil, mayonnaise, baked goods and snack foods like potato chips. Since Texas is a major cotton growing state, Paul sees his culinary approach as supporting local farmers. When my customers come in, they ask where my product comes from. I can tell them it comes from the South Plains. You know, I, I know that my farmers did that. And two, you know, it's helping the people that are in here buying food from me. You know, and if I can keep them in business, then they're going to keep me in business. Okay, guys, let's go. We're ready to go. A good portion of Paul's business is catering to community activities in Lubbock and the surrounding area. He has a fitting customer on this late summer morning, cooking for some 150 cotton growers at an annual cotton gin co-op meeting. Once the buffet line is set, the cooking gets underway. More than 100 pounds of chicken pieces, along with catfish fillets, are deep fried to a golden brown. Once you pull it out of this batter, you want to want to knock any excess batter off, pat it a couple times. That'll also flatten your fish out. As with everything in cooking, timing is essential to delivering the product to your plate. You can see on this chicken right here, it's coming out to a nice golden brown. You can see how crunchy the outside is, and the inside, when cooked at the right temperature, it's still going to have all the, all the juice and all the taste that it needs to have. Once the cottonseed fried food is ready for the table, yes sir, we are ready. Patrons line up to dig into the country cooking laid out by River Smiths, which keeps the cooks hopping. You figure about four pieces of catfish a person, so you're looking at, we're gonna do about probably 800 pieces of catfish. Some of the chemical compounds in cottonseed oil give it heat stability and a long shelf life, characteristics important to cooks like Josh. You know, I can feed up to 5,000, 5,500 people on just, just one, one stretch of cottonseed oil, as long as it's been filtered properly. Cooking traits aside, for diners at this event, the only focus is on taste. Well, I love River Smith. They, the, it makes it nice and crispy, the cottonseed oil does. Uh, River Smith is a long time Lubbock uh, restaurant. We eat there quite a bit during the, the regular year. So anytime they come out to one of these functions, we try to be here. And for Paul and his crew, the end of events like this generate an opportunity to give their cottonseed oil another life outside the fryer. We filter the grease and take it to a bin and then Valley Proteins out of Amarillo comes and picks it up and then they turn it into cattle feed for our, for our ranchers around Texas. So, you know, it's, we're, we're giving back, you know, they, they come and pick it up, they produce the food for the farmers, we're giving back to the ranchers after buying it from them, you know, it's, it's a great thing. Paul will tell you that cottonseed, cooking, chicken and catfish are all part of his family's history. Just look at the mural on the wall. That is actually my dad. That's uh, we uh, all of our logo on everything that we've got is is Old Man River Bob Corcoran, uh, the infamous River Smith catfish king, as they say. I think I'm ready for some fried chicken. That's going to do it for this time. Thanks for traveling the country with us on this special cotton edition of America's Heartland.